Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor James Heckman, the 2000 Nobel Laureate in Economic Sciences. Today, we are greatly honored to have invited Professor James Heckman to deliver a lecture on the university campus. First of all, may I have the honor to invite Professor Joseph Sung, Vice Chancellor and President of the Chinese University, to deliver a welcoming address and introduce our speaker, Professor Sung, please. Dear students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my great honor and privilege to introduce Professor James Heckman. Professor Heckman is currently Henry Schultz, Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1973. He launched and directed the Center for Economics of Human Development at the University of Chicago. He's also a senior research fellow of the American Bar Foundation. He's a fellow of many prestigious societies, such as the American Academy of Arts and Science, the Econometrics Society, the American Statistical Association, and the International Statistical Institute. As is well known to all of us, he is one of the most important and influential scholar to have graced the economics profession. In year 2000, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on microeconometrics of diversity and heterogeneity, and for establishing a sound causal basis for public policy evaluation. Professor Hetman's contribution to economics and econometrics are extensive. He devoted his professional life to understanding the origins of major social and economic problems related to inequality, social mobility, discrimination, skill formation, and regulations and to diversifying and evaluating alternative strategies for addressing those problems. His work is deeply rooted at the intersection of economic theory and empirical microeconomics, micro and he actively collaborates across disciplines to get the heart, to the heart of major problems. His recent interdisciplinary research on human development and life cycle skills formation draws on economics, psychology, genetics, epidemiology, and neuroscience to examine the origin of inequality, the determinants of social mobility, and the link among stages of life cycle. Many believe that these contributions may lead to a second Nobel Prize for him, and we look forward to that, sir. Professor Heitman's evolution as an economist was not direct, and experience in his teenage greatly influenced his research interest. In his childhood, he received strong encouragement from his parents to get a college degree. His early life and family history really have great influence on the choice of his studies and, and as well as the economic theories. Intrigued by the great social changes in the late 50s and the early 60s in the US, he developed a deep fascination with politics, social science, and history. During the high school period, an accidental meeting with Frank Oppenheimer brought Hickman the objective nature of physics and the ability of laws of physics to predict empirical irregularities. The experience led him to appreciate the beauty of experimental science and the pleasure of matching theory to evidence, which established the foundation for his future choice of being an empirical economist. After deciding to become an academic economist and studying economic development, Hickman chose to receive education at the University of Chicago and Princeton. On his graduation, Professor Hickman was first hired at Columbia University in 1970 as a labor economist. During the three years in Columbia, he developed his latent variable framework and become recognized as an uh, econo economic tritions. In 1973, he accepted the job offer as a labor economist and an econometrician at the University of Chicago and has been there ever since. Today, he is one of the most productive and widely cited economists in the profession. He published over 300 papers and nine books, 
According to Google Scholar citation, his article have been cited over 130,000 times in total. And he ranked among the top three most cited economists in human history. Today, we are very happy to be able to listen to him. I understand that he just arrived from the United States yesterday, and I thought he had some jet lag, but the moment that he stepped in, we have a very learned, learned discussion about various things, including cancer, psychology, and I can feel that he is full of energy and he has full of excellent um, ideas in his mind. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor James Hickman. So I want to uh, thank the Chinese University of Hong Kong for inviting me here today and for the very generous introduction by Professor Sung uh, about my own personal background. Uh, I, I am going to talk about uh, something that I think everybody in this room is interested in, or at least should be interested in, and I certainly welcome questions, uh, and I gather we have some time for questions and answers. So this is uh, an example of where uh, maybe uh, I, I illustrate the idea that I am now looking at uh, topics that go across disciplines. I, th I think one of the most exciting uh, aspects of research uh, is kind of like many people now are familiar with Yo-Yo uh, Ma's uh, series called the Silk Road Project, where he's trying to build bridges across cultures. But I think in academic life, something like the Silk Road, uh, cultures, different disciplines meeting, is extremely important for fertilizing research. And so today, my research comes out of this kind of cross-fertilization process. So it's my own travel, if you will, and my personal Silk Road about trying to understand skills. Some of my main interest, as uh, Professor Sung already noted, is on the economics of human development and looking at the structure of what makes people different and what we might do to uh, circumvent differences or at least to try to circumvent differences that might be uh, avoided or promote opportunities for people. But a key question in that whole process, a whole area of research, is truly understanding how to measure skills. And I think uh, it's a serious question. And I know in Hong Kong, in particular East Asia generally, there has been traditionally a fixation on certain measures of skills. And what I want to talk about today is a much broader inventory for skills. So without further discussion, let me, let me get into this. Uh, whoops, now it's suddenly not advancing. Uh, wait, oh wait, it did advance. Very slowly though. This will take a while. Now, why? It's really, I mean, I am clicking it. But it's not, uh... OK, there we go, the introduction. So when we think about productivity of individual lives, I think many people, especially people in, in East, uh, East Asia, in particular uh, in Shanghai, but also I think in Singapore and Hong Kong, think about some of the standard measures of productivity. And we think about individual achievement, it has to do with uh, achievement test scores and IQ. For example, PISA scores are very common. I know many of you are sitting in this room as a result of having high scores on a test somewhere in high school or even in college. And so uh, what I really want to try to explain today is a body of knowledge that's even accepted by the very inventors of the PISA score, that there are many important life skills that aren't well captured. Now that by itself isn't saying much. Uh, but it does say that we can think, or should try to think about broader inventories of human achievement. And so I want to argue that focusing solely or mainly on IQ scores or achievement test scores, uh, it really gives an incomplete picture of what schools, families, and communities produce. And it also, I think, leads to a very poor evaluation of how, what schools are doing, what teachers are doing, and which individuals are likely to succeed. 
And so I want to uh, talk to you, share with you some lessons from a broader inventory of skills that is being developed. So it's an active process. I don't want to talk about something that happened 50 years ago. I want to talk about something that's very much underway in terms of our discussions today. So what I want to talk about is something which has kind of an old-fashioned sounding name, maybe even a Victorian sounding name, but that think skills that are associated with what, what are sometimes called social-emotional skills, what used to be called character skills. These are important and neglected. Health, obviously, important as well. These skills are sometimes called soft skills because they're thought in the past not to be easily measured. But in fact, they are measured. They can be measured, and we have some very hard evidence on them. And the reason why they're interesting is that unlike IQ and some of the measures of uh, uh, cognition, which have received so much attention, that when we think about what are effective targets for intervention and for what schools and what organizations and what families might do, that what we have is more malleability for some of these other skills, more malleability later in life and over the, even into the adult life and uh, more than just straight cognitive skills. And I'll try to make that precise uh, today. But there's also a lot of economics in this as well. And a lot of this is just organized common sense. But it's not common sense that makes its way into social and economic policy. Namely, when we think about different tasks in life, different tasks require different skills in different levels and proportions. And these differences in skills among people lead to choices that we see people making every day. And this is an example of a, of a principle near and dear to economist's heart, which is the principle of comparative advantage. You go where your relative skill levels lie. But a key notion that comes out of this whole literature is that it's very obsolete to take a view of skills as traits. Even the word skill already suggests, and it's a, a choice that I deliberately make in that lecture today. But skills are not just traits. They are things that can be changed. And so even IQ can be changed. We can think about many of these things we used to think of even as genetic traits or traits set extremely early. They are, in fact, uh, they are not fixed. But also, and this is a key notion, that when we measure these skills and we measure these abilities, the measurement schemes that we currently use that govern the discussion about whether Shanghai is doing well relative to some other parts of the world, we have to understand that part of what we're measuring are responses to incentives and situations. So it's both incentives and it's situations that are generating a response. And so that instead of thinking about these skills or these traits as somehow fixed attributes of individuals, what we're really measuring is a strategy in response to in situations. And I'll make that precise and show you some very vivid examples. And so if we want to get to measures of skills that matter, we also want to understand all the other things that matter in producing the measurements that we use. So that's really my, my, my lecture. And if it's all well known, then I can stop and take questions. I don't know. You tell me. But. Let me give you a little bit of background. We're now in, uh, in 2016. Uh, the IQ test is about 100 years old, at least as we, the modern version of the IQ test. And uh, this was started uh, really by uh, a person trying to estimate uh, who would be successful in school. This was a French uh, Benet, who was Frenchman Benet, who was trying to predict who would succeed in certain schools in France. And this led to a huge literature, which is still very active today. And whole societies, like Mensa, where people are deciding who's smart and who's not on the basis of IQ tests. I remember going to a high school reunion a few years ago with some of my former classmates. And it was amazing to me. They were still talking about who was really had a high IQ and who did not have a high IQ 40 or 50 years ago. And it wasn't what the person had done, how successful. Who is high IQ? They could still remember the IQ test. of the, Very strange. But that's fixated in our culture. So what I want to do is just kind of review that. So this concept of cognition, when we think about it, is really a product of early 20th century psychology. And this has been broadened, but it's still the center of a hierarchy of what are called correlated traits. But I'm an economist, and when economists ask about predictive theories, 
we ask how well do these traits or these measures predict something that matters. And if you look at a lot of the work in psychometrics, which is the study of these tests, IQ, achievement, and other tests, there's a certain circularity that the validation in many of these tests is done by using other measures, either other tests or grades or other kinds of very closely related measurement systems. But to me, what's really relevant is what succeeds in life. Who's making successful earnings? Who's basically succeeding? What health choices are? How we might succeed across different dimensions of life? And so, even though IQ was originally designed to predict performance in school, and it's moderately predictive, as I will show you, uh, it still is the case that uh, there are many other important predictors of things like who succeeds in school and also who succeeds in life. And much of psychology has focused on this kind of circular notion of validating a test by some other test. Now, there are some exceptions in the field called personnel psychology, where psychologists are trying to screen who's successful, who would be a good job applicant, and so forth. Then they actually do look at some of these broader measures. And more recently, political scientists and economists have used the measures of achievement tests, the so-called armed forces qualifying test, to essentially predict uh, success in life. And I'll show you some of those results. So let me show you what psychologists, this is taken directly out of a standard work in psychology. And at the core of this is a hierarchical notion that at the center we have something called general intelligence. And then there are aspects of intelligence that have been developed. So nobody says that IQ is like a single number, or there is an IQ number, but it's not just a single notion. That there are other notions, mathematical reasoning, visual perception, aspects of how well you remember, uh, perceptual properties, and other notions. And a distinction is sometimes made between crystallized and fluid intelligence. So the crystallized intelligence is like acquired intelligence, maybe practiced intelligence. So when people get older, they generally have higher crystallized intelligence. That's the theory of why you should keep judges in office for many years. Uh, and fluid intelligence is what many of you have. It's associated with being young, being smart, and picking up questions. You know, just the, the Raven's IQ test is, is, an, is an example of that. So there are these different notions, but G turns out to be correlated with virtually all of these components. Huge literature on this. Now, associated with the IQ test is another test, and that's different. And this is what the PISA test is, and this is what a lot of the tests are that you've taken. These are the tests you take uh, that try to show at the end of a school year or maybe the end of a whole school uh, sequence, like at the end of uh, uh, secondary school or the end of primary school, uh, what your general knowledge is. And so the IQ test was really based on the idea that a trait was fixed and you were capturing a trait which was really thought originally to be genetic. But now the idea of the achievement test was to capture what what schools added to the capacities of students. So it had a dynamic theory. It wasn't capturing a trait. It was trying to capture what was relevant in quote real world tasks. But it was a paper and pencil test. You've all taken PISA tests and people use these tests. So, but even early on, by the very inventors of these tests, and this guy was actually the dean of social sciences at the University of Chicago in 1940, and he's the one who actually, he and some other colleagues were the ones who developed the very PISA test and a lot of the standardized achievement tests. But what he said is really what I'm going to conclude. So I could really stop my talk almost with this quotation. And he says, well, we lean heavily on written exams. And he was the official examiner at the University of Chicago for many years before he went on to the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. But he points out that we lean, we lean heavily on written exams, uh, but we, we could use many other appraisal devices. And so he's suggesting things like what activities students are doing, teacher reports, parent reports, and so forth. But the fact of the matter was, on purely technological grounds in the early 1950s, precisely because of the card reader and the development of what are early versions of the computer technology, the, the short answer, achievement test, which we've all taken, became extremely popular and became enshrined in culture and is there today. So literally, from the very day, the founder of this test was questioning what was done. But nonetheless, I think still today, we heavily rely on written exams. So I want to talk about that practice. Oops, okay. <laughs>
So I want to return to this insight and talk about what we can think of more generally about human potential. Now, psychologists have given a lot of thought to this, and this is where I come in. I've been doing a lot of work over the years with uh, uh, various uh, psychologists, in particular a personality psychologist, Angela Duckworth, who recently wrote a, a bestseller, a best-selling book, I should say, on grit, and I'll come to that. But there, we've had a lot of conferences at Chicago where we're trying to understand what, the, what these traits are and what, what, are, what are these skills. So initially, when people wanted to think of traits other than IQ, they thought of very broad measures. So they went to dictionaries, in this case, the Webster's English Dictionary. Some of the earliest notions were to take traits, all different descriptors of people. So they had as many as 20,000 different characteristics on people. That's unmanageable, of 20,000 different characteristics. And so recently, and I mean quite recently, in the last 20 years, psychologists have settled, personality some psychologists, have settled on what's called the big five. The big five is based on factor analysis of measures of personality. So without describing it, it's really a statistical analysis of assessments, sometimes self-reported assessments, of various aspects of behavior. Now, the one thing that's interesting, let me show you what the big five are, just to give you some examples. The big five, the acronym for big five is OCEAN, the English acronym. So OCEAN stands for openness to experience, which is one of the traits, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And each of these has facets within uh, those five. So those are the big five. And so there's nothing like a G, though. It's not like there's a single trait that is correlated with these five. These are five separate traits, or five separate measurements that are taken. And they themselves have, so each of these you can, you can explore. And uh, here's an example. I don't know if you can see it so well. But for example, openness to experience, that's what the concept means. And it has what are called facets. And so there are these facets that are made. These are all either self-descriptions or observer descriptions of individuals. Uh, and sometimes tests are given, but generally speaking, uh, this is the way it is. And there are childhood versions of these traits. So we can think about these, these states, and they have an obvious sense of conscientiousness, openness to experience, extroversion, agreeableness, and so forth. But there are a lot of different sub-traits, and some of the recent work has actually suggested that certain of these sub-traits within these larger frameworks, the big five domains, maybe are more predictive than the overall aggregate. So there are a lot of different measurement systems out there. They're predictive of many outcomes, but it turns out that these big five traits are still not all that predictive. I'll show you in a minute how predictive they are, just give you some data. Um, but the important thing, and this is really the important thing, is that the big five and many of these measures in psychological traits are defined without any reference to the context in which they're measured. So this is the idea of a trait. It's kind of like, this is me. I am me. I, I'm always conscientious. You can imagine, how conscientious am I in the presence of certain incentives? How conscientious am I? And so this is really where the frontier is. And I'll show you how important these considerations really are. I will point out, and this is somewhat gratuitous, and I shouldn't really develop this since, uh, since this was really developed uh, more for me than by me. But uh, there are analogs in Chinese culture. It turns out when people try to take these big five inventories to Germany or to China, they find that some, uh, there are some counterparts, but typically not exactly the seven, uh, the five. So sometimes people find big five being mapped into big seven. Uh, there's another big uh, seven trait that has been suggested for uh, Chinese culture. So there isn't a sense, in, and then also some of these other traits, the eight virtues, are sometimes matched into the big five. What's happening, you'll, you'll laugh in some sense. And this really suggests that the evidence is here that we have some, we really do have uh, a lot of work to do. So here, here's a facet of trying to see how the big five factor matter uh, model maps into some existing schemes from either historical figures in Chinese history or some of the more recent efforts to try to come up with inventories of, of Chinese uh, uh, that are more Chinese culturally based. So there is an issue of how general those traits are. But a big question that comes out, and this is a very important divide that shows up in behavioral economics, it shows up in psychology, and shows up all around, is what's called the person-situation debate. 
And this is an extreme example, what I'm going to call the identification problem. And so in one extreme case, social psychologists have argued that the variation across people and behavior is not a consequence of individual traits. It's not like I am conscientious or not. It has strictly to do with the situation I'm placed in. So I'm placed in a situation where I'm under heavy scrutiny, I'm being observed, I have strong incentives to be conscientious, I'll be conscientious. And in fact, Michelle, a famous a personality psychologist, famous psychologist, uh, wrote a paper some 50, almost 50 years ago now, uh, in which he said that basically IQ is a fairly stable trait. But the idea that there are stable traits and personality traits is completely untenable. So that really, this is all situationally determined. So I'm not me. There's not a me. There's a me in a situation. And what's interesting and somewhat ironic about that, I don't know if many of you have heard about the marshmallow test. Everybody's heard about the marshmallow test. You've heard about it. Well, it's this test that Michelle gave. And he gave it for completely unrelated reasons. He took these little kids. You can go to YouTube and look it up and see the the actual original tests were videotaped and they're posted. Little kids were given these uh, marshmallows and they were told, look, if you wait for 20 more minutes, you'll get a second marshmallow, but don't eat the first marshmallow, okay? And so he looked at the kids struggling and some kids ate the marshmallow, some didn't. Now what was interesting is that about 20 years after Michelle wrote this statement, there's no such thing as a stable trait, he found out that the kids who waited for the marshmallow were the ones who graduated from high school, had much lower crime, were going to college, were getting higher earnings, and on and on and on. They've been followed now. And so actually, Michel, ironically, about the time that he was writing this, identified at least some evidence for a stable personality trait. But nonetheless, the debate is really valid. It's a valid debate. And so more recently, my colleague at the University of Chicago, uh, Richard Thaler, has suggested that there really isn't a stable and so this is a very non-trivial issue in behavioral economics and in economics. Just what is it we're measuring and should we classify individuals or should we classify individuals only relative to the situation? That's the question. That's a really big question. So what do we know? So I don't want to boil, bore you with too many numbers and, uh, but, and that's one of an occupational hazard and one for me in particular. I, I do a lot of data analysis and I, I tend to think that everybody else likes to do it too. Uh, and I always learn the hard way that uh, nobody does, uh, very few do, and they're hardcore. But nonetheless, assuming I have a few hardcore, I'll show you some data. So there is a lot of evidence, though, across many outcomes that there are uh, measured personality traits are as predictive, if not more predictive, than standard measures of cognition. But situation matters. So that's not really basic. But there's mounting evidence that things, the biological basis, that personality is an important determinant of behavior. And this also shows up in studies that have been done in behavioral genetics, showing heritability, and then studies that have been done how brain structures altered through accidents, through some kinds of disease and the like, have fundamentally changed aspects of what we think of as personality. So there does seem to be a biological basis. But the question is, what exactly is being measured? And so I want to talk about these new approaches and what we learn and what we can think about them. So instead of thinking about a test as capturing traits or skills, I want to make the following, what I think is a commonplace but extremely important observation. And that is that every psychological measurement you use, whether it's a PISA score, an IQ test, a personality test, is always a measurement on performance on some performance on a task. It's a measure of how well. And so my colleague, or general colleague, he's at the University of Illinois, but he's close enough and we interact often, uh, Brent Roberts, has written that uh, personality is a stable trait about enduring thoughts and feelings. So this is a kind of verbal definition of what personality traits are. But what I want to put forward today is a notion of a task-based framework for identifying and measuring skills. And so I think the distinction between tasks and test is artificial. The IQ test is a task. And I can alter IQ. In fact, one of the famous experiments that was done in this area was a study that was looking at black-white differences in IQ in the United States some 40 years ago. And it turns out that if you look in terms of standard deviation on a Raven's IQ test, 
blacks are one standard deviation at that time or one standard deviation below the average white measurement in the United States. Now it's two-thirds of a standard deviation, but there's still a significant difference. But what it turned out was that if you took kids, and did, these are some randomized trials that were done on school children, and you took kids, and you basically took black kids and white kids, and you took black kids, and you basically just gave these kids one small candy for each successful answer, each correct answer on the IQ test, on that particular administration of the IQ test, the black-white gap vanished. And it turned out that the response was greatest among children who were least conscientious. So in terms of what economists like to think of as a supply function, what happened is the most conscientious kids were already working at full capacity. They already took this very seriously. The less conscientious kids had to be incentivized and you could reduce the black-white IQ gap, at least for that administration of a test. And there are many, many other examples. We actually have some studies that we're doing now in China, uh, looking at, at variation of tests uh, and showing what the responses are. So I would just make this diagram, put it through here. This is as much mathematics. I was told not to use any mathematics, so I'm not. This is a diagram, call it a graph, I guess, if you want to be fancy, but it's really very simple. But what it's saying is that we only have outputs on tasks. All tests are outputs on tasks. And we want to try to infer what skills are. But we think, what are the efforts, effort, incentives, and motivation, and situation and constraints are all affecting the outputs on a task? So I give you an IQ test. There recently is a book out suggesting that if I give starving people an IQ test, they do much less well than if they're well fed. I personally don't consider that a big insight, but that's. The point is, is that that, I would put, is situation and constraint. So we're starving somebody, or if I, take, I turn the heat up to 150 degrees in a room when you're taking an IQ test, my prediction will be your IQ is going to be much worse than if I gave you normal temperature. So I think we really have to think about it. But realize that right now, what we're doing is we're looking at one graph. We're saying skills go to the output on the test. And then we're saying then the output on that task is a measure of skill. So we're inverting it. We're saying not just one way cause and not controlling for the other aspects. So let me show you uh, what we can say. So what I want to argue is instead of relying exclusively or mainly on self-reported measures, I think there are better approaches. And this I want to talk about. This is what uh, Tyler was talking about in that quotation. So when we think about behaviors more generally, we have teacher reports. And it turns out that grades even though grades are frequently discredited as saying they're biased, the teachers have certain favorites and so forth and so on, although that can be eliminated by averaging grades over multiple teachers, but nonetheless, you say there might be some bias in grades. Grades turn out to be more predictive even of success in college than things like IQ or achievement tests. Past behaviors and choices are manifestations of the same underlying skills. And more recently, economists have been eliciting these measures of preferences and of psychological parameters uh, from both field experiments and controlled trials in laboratory settings. And so this has now become an important tool in shaping and understanding how we can think more generally about the structure of uh, what, what human preferences are. So what I want to do then in terms of this diagram is suggesting how in various laboratory settings and in various losing both behaviors uh, that we observe and experiments that we can conduct and placing students in different situations, varying the incentives, varying essentially why they would work or not work and changing the situation. It's that principle of variation which will allow us to, to extract what the true skill is. So that's really the, the research task. So let me just give you a few quick facts. I already told you this, that IQ tests and achievement tests are, are typically done in a, validate in a circular fashion. So you go to the test and say, look, the AFQT is validated against the DAT, or the, or the SAT is validated against some other test. And that doesn't tell me anything. What I'm interested in is how successful people will be in various real world tasks. So what I want to argue is real world situations. So let me just skip through a few slides. We have some, a paper which I'm which I'm working on, which is just coming out actually in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences with these co-authors. And let me just share, you, well, share with you some, uh, 
some findings. So we can find, for example, that even though sometimes we conflate the idea that IQ and grades are the same and IQ and achievement tests are the same, these are really measuring different concepts. And so what, what's, what's, the, what, what's the difference? In, and what it turns out is that there's a, there are correlations among these factors. And so I won't go through the extensive tables. These are different data sets that have different measures, but there are correlations. But the only important thing I would extract is the correlations are far from one. These are data in Europe and data in the United States and data in the United Kingdom. And so you do get differences in correlations. The measures differ, but there's still, and so there is a positive correlation, but they're not, not anywhere near one. So it's not that we can, so we can ask the question, well, if we actually look at something like an achievement test score, we actually ran an experiment, we ran some studies in a school in Holland, we can actually ask, well, we have an achievement score, it's called the DAT, it's not important, the name, it's very close to something like the SAT or the Armed Forces Qualifying Test. What you find here in, 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 this, in this school is you can explain about 20% of the variance in the achievement test if you put in uh, IQ, Big Five, and uh, Duckworth's grit. Uh, grit is not explaining a tremendous amount here, you can see, in terms of achievement test, but it is uh, it, it bundled in with the big five. It's very closely related to conscientiousness. So what does this say? Achievement tests, if we put all these factors in, we explain about 20% of the achievement tests. Far from a perfect correlation, suggesting there are many other factors going on in the achievement test. If you ask what explains grades in school, well, grades in school themselves, if we put all these factors together, explaining about 7% of the variability across students, and what does IQ explain? About 1%, very small. And if we ask now, what is the, uh, uh, if we put all these together, we get about 7% again, and grit plays a bigger role. But that role that grit plays depends on, what, on the gender. It turns out grit plays a very strong role for women, but not for men. So these factors seem to be going all over the place. This is showing you what the different factors contribute. Probably not so important to dwell on this since I have uh, used up a big chunk of my talk already. Oops, I think I know what I'm doing wrong. Yes, I'm pointing it not at this. Okay, uh, okay. So now we can ask ourselves, we get similar findings. I, I'll just verbally summarize that across multiple data sets. So instead of dwelling on that, what I want to argue is that personality predicts grades. And in fact, in some sense, personality, as you saw, and this is true across multiple data sets, is a stronger predictor than, um, than actually um, IQ. But if you look at it for, for, for grades, if you look at something like uh, uh, achievement tests, IQ is a stronger predictor, okay? So here I'm still staying kind of internally. But now what we're really interested in, at least I am as an economist, is how these measures at all predict success later in life not just how well you do in school. Now it turns out, as I mentioned earlier, that if you ask who pred what's predicting who does well in school, the achievement test scores are not as important as, uh, as grades. High school grades, secondary school grades are more predictive. Why? I think I already showed you in part, because grades are capturing some measures of conscientiousness. How hard people are willing to learn and, and, and how, willing, how hard they are willing to, to work. So the question we can ask, how powerful is IQ? So here's an example from British data. It looks very busy, but it actually has a very simple story. This is looking at wages, education, body mass index, number of arrests, life satisfaction, different measures. This first bar is essentially telling you how much of the variability across people in wages, and these people are now in their early 40s, and you ask how much is explained here by IQ? Not that much. So the famous story is, if you're so smart, how come you're not so rich? And I think that's kind of, here's the answer. Here you can also see that IQ and person, personality plays a bigger role, but it's hardly the whole story. So if you bundle all of these things together, IQ and personality, then you're gonna get a little bit more, but you're still gonna find, you, know, you put all these things together, you're getting these measures. But what you can see is that two things, IQ and these other factors aren't playing all that much. Now, by design, remember, IQ was designed to explain who was doing well in school, right? That was kind of, actually, that was Binet's original reason for developing the IQ test. So IQ is not a bad predictor relative to its effect on earnings. But if you look, for example, at measures of 
of uh, personality, it's more important. So Duckworth's term, grit, or conscientiousness, which is really the same concept, is actually really more important about who's succeeding in school, how many years of school. If you look at body mass index, you look at a lot of these other predictors, you're gonna see that these social emotional skills are predictive. And this is true across. But the other thing, the other thing to notice here is that we put all of these measures together, we're still not explaining very much of all these dimensions. And so this is where I use the term somewhat facetiously and maybe pretentiously. This is like our social science version of dark matter. We, there's a lot out there that we don't fully understand. And this is what makes it an interesting research area, but makes it especially important to understand when we start measuring students and start measuring countries on these dimensions, we should understand A, how imperfect they are, how other predictors are probably better than those measures, and that we could actually do, do better. Okay, and we need to do better. So uh, we can then look at a bunch of other data sets and we get a similar finding that IQ is not such a strong predictor of things. This is a very different measure of a Wisconsin data set uh, looking again now at midlife and things like mental health and so forth, physical health. IQ is not that strong a predictor. And you can look at other, uh, you can, a uh, question? I mean, happy to take questions. Oh, okay. Uh, so what we, the one predictor that everybody agrees is, is important among all these so-called big five measures is this measure of conscientiousness. And uh, even people like Arthur Jensen, who made a life out of talking about the importance of IQ, said if there's any personality trait that's predictive, it's conscientiousness. And that's really what Duckworth has talked about and, and what has been found in many, many studies. If you want to ask about the topic that most people are, are, people are always interested in, namely how long they're going to live, and we look at the big five, we can see that in, in IQ, we can see that IQ is a much weaker, or is, is, so I shouldn't say much weaker, but a weaker predictor than conscientiousness. But unfortunately, none of these is very good predictors of, uh, of mortality. And we get similar findings across, across other dimensions of uh, performance, but I should skip past. Personality and crime, we can see that the big five uh, correlate in ways. Delinquents are, are relatively high and extroversion. Uh, okay, the non-delinquents relatively low. Um, agreeableness, uh, not so high for juvenile delinquents. Uh, conscientiousness, not so high uh, for uh, delinquents. And, and so there is a kind of, quote, an obvious relationship but the fact of the matter is, is that the predictive power is still open. So what's the implication for public policy? That measures of personality predict achievement test scores and grades above and beyond IQ scores, and that what, when, when we're measuring these scores and we're looking at things like, you know, Hanushek and others are talking about using IQ or using achievement tests as a measure of the human capital of a country, this is a very limited measure, and we can do better. And we have done better, and we're in the process of doing better. Uh, and so why it's important? Because these achievement tests are widely used. They're used to measure traits required for success in school and life. And many people look at the differences in test scores to make the black-white achievement gap. And so in some sense, we're looking at only one dimension of an important set of dimensions, which we can quantify and which we now know to be very important. So this is where it takes me to the to the, to the rest of it. There, there are a lot of other examples, but I don't have time to go through those. So how do we think about this? How do we think about these traits? Well, this is what I wanna, an, another key point I wanna try to make. And that is they shouldn't think of them as traits anymore. They're strategies. So if you know any game theory or just have, have a notion of what game theory is, in game theory, people are trying to think of how they strategize, how they respond to situations. They bring their own capacities, their own resources, but they're also involved in interactions with other people. And the interaction could be the interaction with a test. It could also be in literally a social interaction with a group of people. And so I want to think of personality as a strategy, and it's an emergent property of a system. And what I want to do is think about what the issues are. So let me just review. So the, there's a really important question that leads us into behavioral economics and leads us into uh, a lot of open issues in economics and behavioral economics and social science generally. How do we interpret personality measures? We can think of these things as, as preference traits. So for example, a lot of work in behavioral economics 
we'll talk about anomalies in human behavior. We'll say, okay, some people have loss aversion. We know that's been pretty well documented by Kahneman and Tversky, and many other uh, uh, certain kinds of biases that appear to be cognitive biases. That's a kind of standard approach. But there's another way to think about this. We can think of these as constraints, that individuals, for example, who are very fearful, who are basically not open to experience, are much less able to acquire knowledge, much less willing to engage, and they, therefore, don't benefit from some of the opportunities that life can offer. And then the expectations. People talk about differences. So personality just may be a measure about expectations that people have, pro or con, about situations. I want to talk about these these ideas bundled in the concept of, of a strategy. But again, I want to capture this notion and go back to this diagram that literally everything we measure is, in, is, is affected by incentives, by incentives and motivation, situations and constraints. And we need to understand that and we need to standardize for that and understand that in placing all of our measurements on, uh, in, 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 in isolate. So it's a huge measurement challenge but it's one that's being addressed. So as I said earlier, the standard practice in psychology is to basically equate the skills to the output on the task. But in fact, that's only part of the story. And isolating that story is, is now, uh, is now is what, what's going on. So I'll skip some of these other models. But there is work now, and this is by some behavioral economists and by some economists mainstream. The dividing line is somewhat arbitrary. But there's work that says economists have a system of preferences that is somewhat different from the big five. I haven't really mentioned these, but I'm showing you these now. So for example, things like time preference. How much are you willing today to postpone consumption, but in exchange for getting a bigger bonus tomorrow? The marshmallow type calculation. How risk averse are you? How ambiguity averse are you? How much are you willing to cope with uncertainty of a type where we don't even know the probabilities of a risk situation. Um, their social preferences. Are, are we altruistic to individuals? Do we have reciprocity? So the question is, can we map these common economic time preference parameters and social preference parameters and risk aversion parameters into the big five? And that's an open research agenda. And fortunately, there's some work on that that's been done by my colleague and friend Armand Falk with uh, Thomas Doman and his co-authors. And without going into the details, since I'm running very low on time, uh, let me just say that several experiments were taken in which individuals were given big five measures of the conventional type. But experiments were also conducted. So people were done where they were given lists of choices between a certain amount of money today and a certain amount of money tomorrow. That's a measure of time preference, OK? And uh, so you can actually elicit that through laboratory experiments among students. You can do this for similar references, parameters for risk, reciprocity, negative, positive reciprocity, trust, and altruism. So these are measures that behavioral economists, economists more generally, have come up with. And the question is, how correlated are they? So when we measure these things, either through experiments or through self-reported questions, you can ask somebody on a pencil and paper test, you know, at what point you become indifferent between you know, waiting today or I get an immediate payoff six months from now of, say, 50 cents. If I give myself a Hong Kong dollar, I get a dollar 50, but I, would, I do that uh, in, in six months, postpone that to nine months. It, when, when do I become indifferent? Well, without going into every detail of every table, the fact of the matter is, is that when these measures of personality that are measured by the big five are measured with the measures of preferences that economists use. There are correlations, although sometimes they're surprising. I want to go through every one of the correlations, but they're far from high. It's not like I can say risk aversion is really just a version of, of conscientiousness or openness to experience. These are very different dimensions. And the same thing is true however we elicit these preferences. And when we look at preference measures elicited this way, we can also look at outcomes in the same way I looked at outcomes before. And we can look at measures of big five and other measures. There's also a measure I didn't show you with IQ. But what we find is that, again, we're not explaining a lot of outcomes. Subjective health reportings, life satisfaction, wages, unemployment. So we have the same general pattern that they predict, 
that they're not fully predictive, but it seems like there's a larger space of characteristics. So the big five taken by psychologists and the big five and the, and the dimensions of economists are explaining different dimensions. So uh, I'll just take you, suggested this paper by Becker and his co-authors. So then the question is, how do we succeed? So I already talked about the, the study about reference bias. And let me just conclude with a discussion of uh, how, what, how the subject is going forward. There is an issue about the stability of these things that we measure. So how stable is IQ over the life of the person? It turns out that after about age 10, 12, pre-puberty pre years, uh, you can learn more, generally speaking, for healthy individuals. There's a very high rank correlation. Your position in the IQ distribution at age 10, 12, and 13 is pretty highly correlated to your position at age 23, 24, and on to later life, okay? We think that fluid intelligence is generally decreasing, crystallized intelligence is increasing, generally G is fairly stable. That's, that's one thing about cognitive. What about the other preference parameters? Well, I'll just show you. There's a trait called social dominance, how much you interact with the larger world, which increases with age, no question. Conscientiousness tends to improve with age. Openness to experience opens up and then starts to diminish with age. Agreeableness goes up and, and stability. And we get various kinds of notion uh, of stability. So let me, let me so, so what happens is, yes, these traits are not traits in the usual sense. There's another process going on. The process is one of human development. And that's another whole lecture. I'm not going to give you much of a story. But it turns out that we can then change. We can even change IQ. If we intervene early enough and with intensive enough interventions, we can alter the IQ of individuals. We can also change these non-cognitive traits. And it turns out that correlating the evidence from neuroscience along with the evidence from personality psychology and from other fields, what we find is that, uh, that, uh, that the, uh, consistent with the slowly developing prefrontal cortex of human beings uh, into the late uh, teens and early 20s, what we find is that there are a fair degree of plasticity and mobility. The rank correlation and measures of conscientiousness, agreeableness, and a lot of these traits are, are fairly low. You actually can find that things can be manipulated, things can be influenced in a positive way and a negative way through interventions and mentoring and so forth. So the fact is there is dynamics and we have a whole subject in which you're trying to understand the dynamics. In fact, that's how I got into this to start with. I'm actually more interested in the dynamics, but to come up with meaningful measures of dynamics, we need meaningful measurements of, uh, of what these underlying traits are that we're measuring dynamically. So let me just conclude very briefly with what I think is a frontier area. Everybody's probably heard of the SAT, the GRE. This is a test now developed by the Educational Testing Service at Princeton University. Books have been written about the SAT, you know, positive and negative. Uh, it's become a way of life. People are very studying. I know that in many countries, uh, in many areas, many, not just in the US and not just in China, but all around the world, students are guided by this. But like I was mentioning at the very beginning, this quote from Ralph Tyler, that there are multiple aspects beyond just what the SAT measures. What the SAT does measure is predictive, but it's fairly weak predictability about life outcomes. And what are the other information sources on personality? Self-reports, teacher reports, behaviors, and computer games. And some of the most exciting recent areas is putting individuals in different situations, whether it's in a computer, whether it's in a group setting, whether it's in a laboratory setting and constructing an inventory so that we can fill in this chart and, and then think about. So I'm not going to have time to do this, but there was a wonderful conference. At least I organized it, so I have a little bias of thinking how wonderful it is. But it brought together a group of scholars from the Educational Testing Service with a group of economists, behavioral economists, and so forth. And one of the papers that was interesting, and you, can, you get the slides. I make these publicly available. There's an educational psychologist who's at the University of California at Berkeley. Her name is Michelle Lamar. And she was using what economists call uh, dynamic programming, or what mathematicians would call dynamic programming, to actually measure intelligence. And so she, what she was doing was seeing how well people solve puzzles in real time and 
The beautiful thing is, with using this as a template, one could imagine varying the situations, the incentives, and then trying to isolate what, quote, fundamental intelligence is and how important the situation is. So that's a research area. So my guess is that 20 years from now, when you're replaced here in this room, probably this room will be replaced by, by, uh, uh, by some other facility, but when the next generation comes along, that generation will have been screened, I think, by a much richer, broader notion about what the tests are, what it takes to succeed in life, what it takes to succeed in college. And to me, I think this is an exciting frontier. And so I would say the modern understanding of skills recognizes the diversity of skills. It's much more than IQ and PISA tests. Social emotional skills are important predictors of success in life. But we have a lot more to learn. And what we've also learned, though, and I didn't really develop that today, is that these social emotional skills are more malleable and they're an opportunity for intervention. So some of the mentoring interventions that are actually being done now in high schools and in job training programs and in apprenticeship programs are pretty effective and they're operating generally in the margin of these social and emotional skills. And I think this is a new opportunity for thinking about how we improve the lives of people. But I think the key lesson I like to think of, and I see this as a research area, is that instead of relying exclusively on tests of the usual kind, that we can use these inventory systems. And this area is one that I think is exciting. It involves a lot of area. and involves different elements coming together, thinking more broadly. And in some sense, we're way beyond the kind of limitations of the 1950s when we had Hollerith card readers and it was a great innovation to be able to take a standardized test and check true, false, uncertain, and get a card reader to give you an exam within 30 minutes of taking the test. That was a great intervention in 1950. But we have comparable measures now with our capacity to process data and our deeper understanding of these skills to come up with much richer inventories. And I think social and political and economic systems will actually start to incorporate these. I think it's an exciting area, and I hope some of you will go into this. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, Professor Heckman, for sharing your words of wisdom. Um, Professor Heckman has kindly agreed to take a few questions from the audience. Now may I invite Professor Junsen Jan, Weilong Professor of Economics and Chairman of the Department of Economics to come onto the stage and conduct a question and answer session. Professor Jan, please. If you would like to raise any question, please raise your hand and our staff will pass the microphone to you. Okay, so maybe the first question go to the lady, our Vice President. Uh, Fanny Jan, psychologist. So maybe a conversation between e economist and psychologist is a, uh, is a good introduction yeah, to the Professor q &A. I happen to know my research area is in personality assessment. That's why I know, listen to your talk with you know, very intense interest. Um, uh, first of all, no, uh, like a comment on the Big Five because uh, my own research area has demonstrated the Big Five is not contextualized in the cultural uh, um, context of uh, Asian uh, psychology and therefore uh, uh, it misses out some of the dimensions you mentioned like uh, trust, uh, reciprocity that are very important components of Chinese personality. In fact, we have developed a Chinese personality assessment inventory at, uh, at the Chinese University together with the Institute of Psychology that demonstrated some of the uh, deficiencies of the Big Five uh, uh, because it's not contextualized uh, in culture. Uh, however, no, the other deficit in you know, some of the measures of the Big Five and also some of the other measures you mentioned in China is because it's a lexical measure. It comes from vocabulary and not real-life behavior. So no, uh, therefore, uh, they you know, tend to be uh, more static. Um, uh, however, you're, you know, you're trying to redefine personality as strategies, uh, but if we go back to the definition of uh, personality as you know, more stable traits, especially when the big five people were trying to say that those are genetically determined and not you know, more malleable, uh, I, I would you know, think that right now in psychology we take uh, traits, right, personality, IQ, more as distal traits, uh, 
And then we need to have mediation through more proximal variables. So you know, the expectancies, the motivational variables, strategies, those could be used as more uh, proximal variables to mediate the traits. Uh, and then they could be moderated by some of the environmental, situational variables, uh, which can come up with better prediction, uh, and not just you know, through multiple regression, but you know, through more modeling, where you can have the mediation and the moderation. I'm wondering whether you could you know, would consider you know, taking this you know, more multidimensional uh, perspective, uh, and not just trying to change the definition of personality. Uh, I, I would very much like to get a copy of these. I mean, I, I, I do know, I, I probably uh, I did not mean to ignore uh, work done here, if I didn't know it. Uh, but if I go back to this figure, uh, oh, I don't know if I'm going to find the figure. It may be a figure I kept putting up, now I can't find it. You all know it, so let me see if I can find it. Uh, there, this thing here. So this is exactly the kind of schema we're talking about, I think. And that is, you see, there, there's a notion, and this is where I think there's really an open research question. I think the tradition, you're right, it's a lexical notion. The original work on this was basically literally looking at a dictionary and looking up descriptors of human beings. It wasn't looking at behaviors. And so it's not predicting in what we think of in a way that would be useful. Uh, but I think there's a question. And the question is whether or not these things that we're trying to call traits or skills are themselves manifestations of some deeper, saying, underlying preferences, OK? So in other words, I want to be, say, President of the United States. And I may hate people. I just may hate being around people. But I want to be President. So think Richard Nixon, for example. I don't like dealing with people, but I, I really, I don't like people so gen but I really want to be elected President. And so what I will do was it effect a whole series of behaviors that made me look like I'm very happy with people. I shake hands. I go out in the crowd. I do all kinds of things. And then we know what he really thought about it when we listen to the Watergate tape. So, but but that's, that's a side issue. The point is, is that, that then there is this larger question of preference leading to the manifestation of what we call a trait. Or is there something called a trait? And I think that's not resolved. And I, so when I mentioned this work by Dolman and Falk, I thought that was quite interesting uh, because you know, it's flirting with the idea that here we have these things that economists think of as preferences. And you're absolutely right. If you look at the Chinese Big Five or the Chinese Big Seven, a version, it's not counting a lot of these things like filial piety, this notion of reciprocity, this aspect of the social situation, which is far more important in traditional Asian culture than it is in Western culture. But again, it partly is a matter of what the incentives are. And so uh, I think it's an open question. I don't, there's a, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a psychologist at Northwestern University whose name I'm forgetting just right now, but he has a paper called The New Big Five. Do you know who I'm talking about? And anyway, it's a new big five, but it's really basically saying, well, we might want to put preferences on this list. And, and then the, these things that we call traits are just manifestations of the preferences. But then for an economist, we say, OK, we have preferences. We face constraints. These are the situations and the constraints. And then the, because of the incentives, and the, the preferences underlie this incentive and motivation, then when we hit the individuals with incentives, they put out certain effort or don't put out certain effort. So that's, I think, is the way we should conceptualize things. Now, here, I'm being an economist, and you're a psychologist. But I think they come largely to the same thing that we really want. When you talk about contextualization, I really want to put in these other factors that are leading to the actual behaviors we, but I think the key agreement is, so when I got Brent Roberts to admit that taking an IQ test was a task, like any other task, and you know, I can dig a ditch, I can take an IQ test, I can you know, plant a flower in my backyard, that those are involving multiple traits and different levels of effort. And I think we need to try to break that in. I think we're starting to succeed, though. The, I don't know if you would agree that we are. But I'm not sure when you talk about distal. Here you're thinking of a measurement scheme. And here what I'm trying to do is break it up into a scheme that's more congenial to economists about some underlying set of preferences, like Nixon wants to be president. And then he faces a constraint. 
that uh, you know he hates being with people, uh, but he but he but he wants he sees what the effort will be and what the reward would be if he shakes hands and appears to be friendly to the human race. So then he becomes friendly in the proper situation. So he's very Michelian. He responds to situations, and then privately, you know, maybe hates goes sort of pounding the wall and so forth. But but so so I think there's a deep deep question here, which I think. But I think it's a question that should be honestly addressed here in this whole measurement issue. We don't want to just stop with PISA scores or stop with IQ tests, but I think that's the way a lot of the literature has done. I'm sure not in your work from, from your question, but I think more generally, at least in economics, people have been very uncritical. So I don't know if that's an adequate answer to your, but I'd be very, I really would like to see your measures and your contextualization. Welcome to have dinner with us. And then you have, have a deep conversation and uh, discussion and even debate um, between you two. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> I tell you. But I mean, but, and people like Brent Roberts and others say, oh, the big five is universal. But it's not. And I know that in, in the discussion with Asian, uh, with the Chinese version of the big five, we know that that, from what I've seen, those references I have, they do obsolete. And I'd definitely like to see your work. But there are these cultural traits. Anyway, okay. how they get developed is another issue. Okay, I think uh, this gentleman. Uh, identify yourself and... Yeah, uh, I'm a professor at the City University of Hong Kong. I'm, I, I'm doing finance. Now, the recent uh, phenomenon in China is about this social mobility. Yeah. I am the, the privilege of the families. They, they have all these the resources and that they, their kids tend to do better than these underprivileged families. And uh, so this is an issue about initial endowment. Uh, it's, a very, it's not at the highest rank, it's at all ranks of the society. So I'm not sure, I mean, even in the US, you know, the, the Donald Trump become the candidate, you know. Uh, whether this has anything to do, the, the US the situation is much less severe. Um, you know, you have fewer people and you have more opportunities. But still, the middle class maybe still have this uh, stagnation of this mobility. And you know, how do you comment? Maybe, I'm not sure whether it's related to your research. Well, it is, but that's another part of it that I didn't talk about today. And that is the component about intergenerational mobility. And when you think more generally about these, these things we're calling skills, one of the important life skills, which I showed you in some of the figures, was some of the non-cognitive traits are very important determinants. So it's not just low IQ, it's that the level of conscientiousness among certain groups, the level of motivation. Look, some of the most effective interventions for disadvantaged people in the United States has been teaching them uh, a very, very simple things that middle class parents would teach their children. So the, 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 the comedian Woody Allen made this claim that 80% uh, of success is showing up. <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know if that's uh, quite the right percentage. He's not a psychometrician. But I think what he's getting at is perseverance is really important. And some of the interventions that have been very effective, even in the middle, uh, not middle age, but in, in the adolescent years for disadvantaged children, has been teaching them some basic life skills, like interacting with others, some teaching of social, sociality, what, what a respectable nature of discipline might be, and showing up on time, you know, and, and interacting in certain ways. So I think these kinds of life skills do affect mobility. But they, the, what I see as a positive is they can be affected by intervention. And that intervention, I think, is very promising. And, and in fact, I think that's a neglected part. So, so much of the early work on intervention was thinking about boosting IQ. So, you know, there was a notion, like 50 years ago, Jensen wrote this famous essay saying that, you know, we couldn't really boost IQ. We had some studies from Head Start that suggested, well, you had early interventions, they didn't work. Uh, but he was only focusing on IQ. He didn't notice that these interventions did have effects when you follow them out for 20 or 30 years. And what they changed was the motivation of people. So in one study that we did in Ypsilanti, Michigan, some 30 years ago, uh, down some 50 years ago, but the children are now in their early 50s, that study basically did not raise the IQ of the children, but it raised their grades and it raised their achievement test scores. Said, How could that be? Well, initially it was, you know, not grades, IQ, achievement, all the same. No, 
they became much more motivated. And they became much more engaged. And because they were more engaged, they actually had led much more successful lives, much less reduction in crime. So I think social mobility is a huge, a huge place here where this literature, where we're going. But I just want us to, think, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we want to get away from just looking at this one dimension of human success and understand that we have these multiple dimensions. And then when we look at the interventions, we realize a big chunk of their success has come through these social and emotional, these non-cognitive skills. And that's what I think is very, very, very gratifying, that we have other measures of promoting social mobility. Trump, I don't want to talk too much about. I can't explain too well, but uh, that's a different issue. <laughs> Thank I'll you. Let Jensen explain yeah. Uh, next two questions go to students. I know there are some my colleagues uh, holding up their hands, but may, any students, any question? Okay, we don't know, no questions? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm asking, oh, okay, good, okay. Thank you, Professor, for the speech. Uh, I'm Akshay, I'm an undergraduate student here at CU. Um, I had a question about uh, the impact of these personality traits on the economic outcome. For example, do people with a particular personality trait tend to earn higher than others? Or do the people in poverty tend to have a particular personality trait that's actually keeping them in that position? And if there is such a personality trait, how could it affect uh, poverty alleviation policies in that well, aspect? You know, there, isn't, uh, there used to be this kind of social Darwinist notion. Uh, uh, back 120 years ago, right, that, that certain classes of people, certain groups, even certain races were thought to be low IQ, and, and we thought about this. Now recently, there was a book written, so did, quoted me, uh, without my approval or disapproval, but trying to make a similar social Darwinist argument on personality. And they, it's a book called The Welfare Trait. It's published in Britain, I think, about a year ago. So you can read it. Uh, I don't want to endorse the book or attack it. I mean, he does report some interesting correlations. But what he gets at the notion is that there's this fixed trait, and that some people are shiftless, and, you know, have very low motivation. They start life uh, bad, and they, they end up bad. These are the drunkards. I'm a little less deterministic in this regard. I think what we've seen is a lot of work on human development. Now, you ask, do these non-cognitive and social-emotional traits, do they predict economic and social success? Yes, they do. And in fact, what's interesting is that some of the more conscientious people, I showed you things about mortality, but if you look at more direct measures of health, you find that they actually would tend to be less lower BMIs, they would tend to be less measures of disease, more advantage lives in, in many, many dimensions. Ways that we never thought of back 50 years ago when there was so much emphasis on cognitive psychology and just on IQ. So I think what I would argue was uh, there is some component and I, you know, if you look at the behavioral genetics literature, it will tell you that about 50% of everything is inherited. I'm not, I, I don't believe in the literature too much. I mean, there are a lot of questions there. Because uh, the way they measure things, they don't really control for, for, the, what, for the very thing they're trying to measure, heritability. But, but the point is, is that, that uh, there is some link, and there does appear to be a biological basis. So there's a very famous case about uh, a railway worker in the United States 100 years ago who had a spike, went through his front prefrontal cortex. Damasio has written about this gentleman. Forgotten his name. Do you remember his name? Anyway, it doesn't matter his name. Anyway, this guy was apparently very bright. He was very affable, very much liked by his railroad crew. And the spike went through his brain. It didn't kill him. Then he went back to his job. But he was a totally different personality. Totally different personality. And so he was just as smart, he was able to keep the records and do it. But what he couldn't do was work with others. He lost his temper quickly. So there do appear to be biological determinants. And we know that when you give people oxytocin, we have chemical and various kinds of biological interventions, we can change the nature of their personality. So in that sense, there may be something trait-like. But it also is the case that we see that these traits are far from perfectly rank correlated. Somebody who's highly conscientious at seven isn't necessarily at 17. And we also see a series of interventions that can promote that. So I don't know what you make of that. I think I, I make of it as some sign that, yes, there's a predictive of behaviors, but it's not like they're totally determinative. 
And in fact, as I showed you, I didn't go through all the graphs and all the details, but these traits are evolving over life. People become more conscientious as they get older, and we do know that there are various aspects. A lot of work on the adolescent brain is suggesting more risk-taking behavior, maybe less perception. There are some studies done by economists and psychologists suggesting that time preference is actually in decreasing with, with age, that people are less impulsive with age. We, that's all very intuitive. We see it in terms of the way we regulate the lot, choices of adolescents, especially young adolescents and so forth. So I think we understand that there is a developmental process. But what's exciting to me is that what, how we can actually capture what the features are, what those processes are, how, how we can successfully engineer and create advantages for people. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe last question. I know Dozha has a question you want to ask. Oh, okay. This my colleague. Uh, I'm Dojo Li. Uh, I'm teaching at the uh, Department of Economics at CUHK. Uh, thank you for a mind-provoking talk. I have a normative question. Say, uh, do you think we should, uh, or whether it is possible to design our policies to select a person of a certain trait? I mean, to make sure people with a certain trait to become successful later in, the, in their life. I have, say, for example, if we believe that uh, the future of human being depend on uh, breakthroughs in sciences and uh, social sciences. And we believe these breakthroughs are made by great minds, including, say, El uh, Einstein or Van Neumann, uh, including yourself. See, if we say these people all have extremely high IQ, then we should make sure that people with extremely high IQ to be at least selected by the higher education or to get their potential fully utilized. Related to this, uh, say, in past few decades, I think I observed that, uh, say, the percentage of, of, this is perhaps politically <laughs> incorrect, the per percentage of uh, female college students has been increasing in the past few decades, right? If, suppose we can observe that uh, the college, the average IQ of college students have been decreasing, then perhaps we should examine the education system, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just want to know what you think about this. Thank you. Well, in terms of the uh, interesting point you mentioned about uh, women's college participation, it's been a phenomenon around the world, it's not just in China. Oh, it's not just in China or the U.S. Uh, it's, uh, it's true in Tunisia. It's true in Iran. It's true in Germany. So the, actually, in most countries, more women are going to school than men. And if you look at those traits, I didn't dwell on this. There are some important gender differences. Uh, I think uh, one of the old studies, uh, Jensen contributed to this uh, uh, about brains versus brawn and so forth. I think there's also another dimension of character and personality. I think uh, the modern economy, I mean, you know, there have been a lot of opportunities available to women. But the fact of the matter is, if you look closely at those graphs, I didn't dwell on the gender difference, but women are generally more conscientious than men and that at the extremes uh, of, of kind of extreme behaviors, bad behaviors, you'll find many more men than you would women. If you look at criminal behaviors and, and, and various other aspects, uh, certainly men are, 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 are more heavily endowed, if you used to say, with a negative trait. Uh, so I think what you'll find, though, is that, uh, that selection on the trait is actually what's going on. I mean, if you look at who's actually graduating secondary school, it's more women than men. And that actually has been true even earlier, even in earlier years. I think what's happened in the last 30 or 40 years for women has been the opportunities have opened up. And so the return to education has been higher. And then what was already a pre-existing ability is actually now uh, mainly more conscientiousness, staying on task, and, and certain kinds of, I think, higher endowments and these non certain non-cognitive traits that are uh, very effective in schooling, that women have had those endowments, and now they've had a chance to use those endowments. So it's led to much higher participation in schooling. So I would interpret it slightly differently. I'm not sure the IQ of the human race is going down. <laughs> and I, I think it's hard to find big gender differences in IQ. I think Though, there is a psychologist at the University of, uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, what's his name? Uh, it's a hyphenated name. Do you know who I mean? 
He's written on gender differences in, in various aspects of uh, psychological measurements. And it is true that it seems like certain kinds of spatial tasks, men seem to do somewhat better. But it's not all men and not all women. It's, you know, you've ever taken the 2D versus 4D test? You know this test? The testosterone surge in the third trimester. So it turns out that if the 2D, I don't quite remember how it goes, but I think if the 2D second digit is bigger than the fourth digit, or maybe I've got it reversed, that that associated with a higher testosterone surge. And whatever that means, that also tends to be high, more highly correlated with certain kinds of spatial abilities. And there does seem to be some notion there of maybe a difference between. But then the female brain has been analyzed somewhat differently than the male brain and the sense of being able much more to do multitasking. And so that shows up, for example, in some of the, some of the measures that have been taken, like stroke recovery. My understanding is that women are much better at recovering because they are thinking with both lobes of the brain. That's one test. A second is that dealing with ambiguity, which is not, not uncertainty, but ambiguity, is, un, is unknown parameters of a model. So multitasking, women do much better and we have a measure of this uh, in, a, in a paper we published uh, with some of the same co-authors. So there do seem to be some behavioral differences, and I think um, some, some traits that are different. Whether or not those are forever endowed in the, in the genes of women versus men and, and the, kind of the, the fundamental chromosomal patterns is, not, is open to question. You know the studies that my colleague John List has done about risk aversion. He did some of these studies in, uh, I think it was in Nepal, where he found a matrilineal society. So you had a matril so the traditional notion is that women are more risk averse than men, although we found that men were more ambiguity averse than women, much less willing to deal with that kind of ambiguity. But what List found was that in a situation where you had a matrilineal society, the women were actually more risk taking than men. So again, that suggests maybe these things are socially constructed. So there's a deeper question of how these traits get to be where they are. But for whatever reason, I think we've seen an enormous improvement, right, in the status of women. And I think it's one of the great questions of social science in the next century, and of the last half century, is exactly understanding gender differences and how changes in opportunities for women are changing society. It's huge. So I, I hate, if you were saying that you think that I wasn't quite, I don't want to put words in your mouth that IQs were declining <laughs> because women were going to school. I don't think you really meant that, right? <laughs> Hypothetical. I don't think that's actually the case. But we do find, actually, in the US, Pedro Carnero has a paper showing that in the US, anyway, that the abilities of students going to school, college students, men and women, were generally lower than they were 20 years before. And that does suggest you know, that there may be some notion. So back to your normative question, what I, in some other papers I've done, that they're really College is not for everybody. This is the notion of a vector of characteristics that we have. And some people are better suited for other tasks, like social, certain skills that would, would have to do with uh, what you think of as uh, skilled apprentices, skilled trades, which don't require four years of college. So in the US, you know, President Obama and many people have said, college for all, and they generally mean four years of college. That's crazy. I mean, we know that uh, we actually compute that the rate of return for people with low levels of cognitive and non-cognitive ability is negative. It's much better to go off and get a job or to take two years of school at beyond high secondary school or to get some kind of training. So we need to have a richer notion. So that would be what I would take from the normative task. But on the IQ issue, so you're, you're sounding a little bit like Lee Kuan Lee in Singapore. You know, he had this whole, whole system of IQ-based stratification. And IQ itself is not valued. So it's certainly true that von Neumann had a very high IQ, no question. Einstein, I'm sure, had a very high IQ. But I, I almost so told that Al Capone had a very high IQ and that Adolf Hitler had a very high IQ. So I mean, I don't think just being smart is enough. There are other traits that matter. And, and I think then it's, so I, I'm sure that Lee Kuan Lee was not thinking about Adolf Hitler or Al Capone. I don't know if Hitler took an IQ test, or, and I don't want to say. But I'm saying you can suggest, you can have the evil genius too, right? So you can imagine somebody manipulating markets and so forth. So you want some measure of these traits that are useful. So that's why I'm very hesitant 
But I do think the personnel psychologists are becoming much better at screening, sorting people into where tasks. And in fact, this conference that I mentioned at Chicago, people were developing a, a, a set of tests, literally task-based tests, that were done to kind of screen people into repairing and just getting groups of people who are best suited to repair a jet engine. So this is like a jet engine, which is actually a very complex system. So getting their IQ is not enough. So smart people, what they had is to have a comprehension of a system that they could understand the different parts. And that was a different trait, as it turned out. It was very useful for finding out who would be a successful Air Force mechanic, for example, or a mechanic for an airline. Than, than just finding an IQ, or how good you are, or what Newton's three laws were, or any kind of the sort. So I do think we're gonna get much better at being able to predict who's successful, and telling people themselves, giving them advice about where they could be successful and where they wouldn't. So, so I, I would hate to talk about just IQ, right? Uh, I think, I mean, IQ is important, for sure. Creativity is important. But IQ alone is not enough. I've seen plenty of very, very smart people who've never done anything, simply because they couldn't take the risk. They wouldn't take the next. So this creativity is a very different aspect. And it's something we don't fully understand, but it's people, you know, the one thing that was found for entrepreneurs, that this is at a junior scale, not von Neumann's and Einstein's. But it turned out there's a study by a guy named Jonah Rubinstein, he's a university college, uh, University of London, sorry, business school. And what he found was that People who were relatively smart, but not geniuses, but who were willing to bend the rules a little bit in secondary school, turned out to make very successful entrepreneurs. So they were thinking out of the box. They weren't going to prison, but they were breaking the rules because they, you know, they, they thought in an unconventional way. So to me, that's very suggestive, you know? And it kind of it, it rings true, right? So somebody comes along and just does something slightly differently. And so they run against the tur they, they run against the current. So I think we're we're heading in that direction. But I would hate to be I would like to make that as a as something that would give people opportunities. So we understand these are what you might be very good at. But the people themselves should probably decide. You know, we don't want a situation where you take a series of tests and then you're now the rest of your life, you're a day laborer and you're a nuclear physicist and so forth. I don't think we're there. I don't I, I don't think we'll ever be there partly because who the we are is changing. So there are a lot of people who at age 12 and 16 are very different than they are at 26. And so we want to give them that chance and chance to learn about themselves. So long question. Okay, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I know we are running out of time. So uh, this session is over. I pass to the MC for the next uh, item okay. where it is indeed our great honor to have invited Professor Heckman with us today to show our appreciation. May I invite Professor Fanny Chang, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Chinese University, to present a souvenir to Professor James Heckman. Ladies and gentlemen, the lecture now concludes. Thank you once again for joining us today. <laughs>